So before talking about the better way of making semiconductor, we need to actually uh, talk about something called host or the concept of holes. Okay. So when we talked about uh, a silicon crystal and we said that, well, if I heat this up, I'm going to have these electrons are going to basically absorb some thermal energy and they're going to basically break away from their bonds, right? So when an electron actually leaves the bond, it leaves a void behind it, right? We're going to call that void a hole. This void is basically, uh, well, a free space for an electron to come in so that the valence shell of this silicon atom is going to be completed, right? So we're going to call those voids uh, holes. And uh, if you think about it, let's say that they have this hole at t equal to t1. I have this hole at this location, right? A few moments later, at t equal to t2, this electron here, um, let me, yeah. So this electron breaks away, and the electron actually come, comes and basically fills up that previous hole. Now my hole is actually moved from here to here, right? And at t equal to t3, uh, the hole actually moves from here to there, right? So if you think about it, in reality, it's the electron that is moving from right to left. But if you look at this from a, like a visual perspective, it's actually easier to see that the hole is actually moving from left to right, right? So this is actually, so the hole is like the absence of electron. It's not really a, 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 an object or like, it's not something physical that you can actually uh, touch it or like basically feel it or, well, not that the electron is, but anyway, uh, you know what I mean? So the, the holes don't exist physically, but they are actually pretty useful for us to actually express some sort of a current to see how sometimes to, to actually uh, explain how the current is actually generated or in which direction the current is moving. Um, expressing it in terms of holes has actually become uh, quite interesting and it, 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 it actually makes our lives much easier. Uh, you will see that in the future slides of this lecture, this week's lecture, um, uh, in more details. Okay, so one thing that we, we will notice later is that the holes are actually moving. If uh, when we when people measure the movement of holes, the holes are actually moving slower than electrons. And you might think that, well, didn't you just said that electrons and holes movement are pretty much the same thing? It's just different perspective. Uh, Yes and no. So electrons could actually move freely without getting trapped by these holes, right? So we have two different mechanisms for electron movement. So when an electron is basically uh, is broken away from a bond, it can actually move freely um, across the crystal. So if you apply a voltage across the crystal, that voltage is going to cause an electric field, and that electric field is going to move the electron from one uh, from one end to the other end, right? And if the electron is not trapped into any of these holes, it's just going to move freely and at a different speed, right? But then with holes, it only happens, like basically they only move when an electron is actually trapped and then released and then, then trapped and then released, right? So they are slower because electrons, the holes only move or the holes movement is based on a trap and release mechanism. So you can even think about it that way that like basically um, holes are those electrons that get trapped and then they get, they get released and then trapped again and then released again and trapped again. And then we have the different category of electrons that just that they're just moving, right? So uh, they don't get trapped, so like they, they can actually move freely. They're, they're gonna move it, they're gonna move much faster than those electrons that get trapped and released. That's why holes are actually uh, are slower in general uh, than electrons, right? The other question that we might have is that, well, how many holes do I have inside a silicon crystal? Well, if you think about it, we only have holes when we have an electron that is broken away, right? So the number of holes or the density of holes is going to be equal to the density of electrons. So if I 
uh, show the density of holes as P and density of electrons as N. And by electrons, I mean the free electrons, right? Uh, they're going to be equal to each other, equal to Ni, right? So for a pure silicon crystal, um, I can say that P is equal to N is equal to Ni, right? Uh, another thing that I can say from this equation, which is very simple kind of a deduction mathematically, but very important in terms of semiconductor physics, is that N times P is going to be equal to Ni squared, right? So we're going to see that, well, Mathematically, this is very simple, like n is equal to p is equal to ni, so n times p, of course, it's ni squared, right? But we're going to see that not only this is correct for pure silicon crystals, we're going to see later that even in extrinsic semiconductors, uh, meaning that for semiconductors that are made of different types of uh, elements, different types of material, this equation is still valid and it's going to actually help us a lot in terms of calculating the density of holes and density of electrons.